So, hot take no one asked for? Clowns? Kinda rad. They're the closest things to living caricatures that humanity has to offer. Exaggerated, goofy folk who just have a propensity for messing up. Inherently, it's one of the most humble professions, filled with humility and laughing at themselves as they bumble forward, often letting themselves be the butt of jokes and getting bystanders in on the act in humorous and ultimately harmless ways. Clowns represent pure spectacle in laughing at yourself, and all of the positivity that taking a step back and chuckling at the simple absurdity of a pratfall can offer. It's fun, and also incredibly easy to defile and make creepy. The evil clown! With such a simple, pure template of look funny, make happy. The idea of something more unscrupulous beneath a clown's stupidly smiling surface becomes very easy to buy into. And you don't need me to tell you that pop culture loves itself some evil clowns. Cads who turn the desire to get everyone else to laugh into finding the perfect way to laugh at everyone else's expense. It's when mischief becomes malicious that the clown turns from silly to sinister. And, yeah, the Joker and Krusty and Piedmon and Pennywise are all really engrossing at a base level. The simple idea of corrupting something so fundamental as laughter creates this macabre lore of how far the clown's sick joke can be taken, and is so instantly understandable that even a child can get creeped out at an unsettling clown smile, even if they don't quite know why. It's a simple, base desire to see something fun and then have it twisted into something as entertaining as it is frightening. And that's Max, baby! <laughs> First appearing in Kirby Superstar, this diabolical little jester has cemented himself as one of Kirby's all-time great nemeses. He's got an incredibly memorable design, some great sprite work and attacks, and that's about it, honestly. Marx only serves as the final boss of Superstar and its remake, and outside of a cameo here and a playable appearance in Star Allies there because it's Star Allies, I mean, of course he's in. They got my boy Wyu in there. He hasn't really done much. Besides beat Bandana D to Smash Brothers, I mean, that, that definitely counts for something. Yet in spite of his simplicity and limited appearances, Mark stands out from the rest of the Kirby rogues gallery as particularly diabolical and unsettling. For all the great demons, beings beyond time, and crafty magicians out there, Marx makes a name for himself by going after Kirby specifically. All he has to do is take the joy, trust, and friendliness that Kirby exudes and corrupt it into his own sinister sideshow. <laughs> Despite being a final boss headliner, Marx has a pretty quaint role in his first appearance. He shows up in the prologue of the Milky Way Wishes mode, pointing out that the sun and the moon are fighting, and that Kirby should really something about it. Telling Kirby of the dream fountains across the galaxy and the great wish-granting comet Nova, Marx sees Kirby off in the final adventure of Superstar, and then just kinda lets the little guy do his thing. Kirby goes around collecting deluxe copy abilities to give himself permanent power-ups, and Marx just chills and lets him do it, seemingly just in the game so that they could represent a Dreamlander without having to redraw a sprite for Rick or something. But when Kirby finally gathers the energy of all the Dream Fountains and summons Nova at the edge of the galaxy, Marx makes his move. He knocks Kirby out of the way, steals a wish to gain power over Popstar, transforms into an all-powerful... <laughs> this reveals that he caused the sun and the moon to fight and leaves Kirby for dead in the vacuum of space. And he would have gotten away with it too, if all those dream fountains didn't revive Kirby and give him the Star Chariot to strike Nova down with. 
Kirby blows up some ancient technology. Mark shows up to fight him. Mark's... And then Kirby takes a nap. Roll credits. <laughs> That's basically it. Mark shows up, backstabs Kirby immediately after his introduction, and dies. It's barely more than bosses like Nightmare Wizard and Dark Mind get. Just something for Kirby to beat up at the end when Dedede's feeling particularly unmotivated. So why does this little imp get to stand out so much? Well, because Marx is designed to be a betrayal of Kirby specifically, and no one will forgive him for that. You don't need me to tell you that Marx and Kirby look kinda similar at a base level, to the point where you could be forgiven for believing that they're the same species. Marx likes food, likes to have fun, and rolls around on a cute little ball. By all accounts, he should be a sweet baby, just like Dreamland's hero. And when he's not, the fact that he's in a universe where Kirby also exists just feels wrong. Like a betrayal of not just Kirby's aesthetic, but of the mood of the Kirby series as a whole. Kirby characters don't really backstab each other. Sure, King Dedede doesn't tell Kirby about why he broke apart the Star Rod here, or neglects to mention the god of the underworld he had locked in his basement there, but no one really takes advantage of Kirby to do anything diabolical. Mostly, they just work around him and hope he doesn't mess their plans up. Even future traders like Magalore would at least try to do things on their own before turning to Kirby, and even old Mags was overwhelmed by the power of the Master Crown, losing his sense of self in the process. Marx, though? He's introduced as Kirby's friend. He knows what Kirby can do. He uses Kirby to get the ultimate power he craves. And his endgame in all this? just to make all the mischief he wants. Marx desires power simply for the sake of it. And he is having the absolute time of his life when all that strength is finally his. Marx laughs his head off when fighting Kirby, teleporting all over the place, shooting lasers out from his best PogChamp face, messing with someone he finally presumes is an inferior. Marx isn't some infinitely powerful being who Kirby just naturally stands in the way of. He chooses this fight with Kirby. He's a brat who wants to get the last laugh on the so-called hero of Popstar. He's a Kirby drunk off of power, basking in the horror of all he can do and abusing it to hurt others. He is a corruption of the infinite potential of Kirby, right down to his hat a perfect reflection of Mirror Kirby's design and color scheme. <laughs> and that makes it so much fun to punch his lights out. Despite the galactic stakes of the fight, beating up Marx is an oddly humble experience. Sure, he's got an arena mimicking the Nightmare Wizard's rapidly zooming star field and one of the flashiest attacks in the series with his black hole that sends you to the pain dimension. But he's also one of the few Kirby final bosses not named Dedede that you fight without a magical weapon. The Love Love Sticks, Super Copy Abilities, Star Rods, and Galaxias are left at home in favor of just slugging it out. With Kirby having access to all of the regular copy abilities collected along with his Milky Way wishes, Kirby doesn't need any souped up powers to take down Marx. What he has inherently is more than enough, fighting the Jester at the then peak of his flexible potential to teach him a lesson. And when he goes down, when all of his tricks and traps are avoided and thrown right back into his face, it feels good. It feels right. And then, just because Marx is a petty little brat, he comes right back. <laughs> Kirby Superstar Ultra introduces the true arena, refights against super forms of some of Superstar's most iconic bosses and Wham Bam Jewel. At the end of that long road, taking down Dedede at his most desperate and the greatest warrior in the galaxy in Galactonite, 
it's revealed that Marx, or at least his spirit, survived the <laughs> and defeated, weakened, mostly dead. Marx does what no other Kirby villain in their right mind would do. He decides to continue being an irredeemable little garbage boy and goes right back to kill Kirby. He's absorbed a Nova's power to bring back his evil soul. This really is the last battle. <laughs> to the bitter end, Marx is completely determined to get the last laugh. He opens the fight with his strongest attack, starting the bout with his desperation black hole and then just tossing it out willy-nilly through the fight. He doubles up his quad cutter to an octo cutter to trip Kirby up. His vines grow lovely roses to mess with their hitboxes. And as his ultimate jape, he steals an attack directly from Drossia Soul, turning into a rain of paintballs. Eating one of these balls gives Kirby the paint ability, an incredibly rare single-use power that usually can only be gotten from two specific bosses. Removing their gimmicks or blinding them entirely, making for much easier fights. And when unleashing the power of paint against Mark's soul? <laughs> Good job wasting your power, idiot. Hope you don't die and have to fight all the way through the true arena again. <laughs> Mark's soul isn't the hardest fight in Superstar Ultra, but being at the end of the hardest gauntlet in the game, tensions rising, doing everything he can to throw you off He's certainly the most discomforting one. And you know there's nothing Marx would love to do more than knock Kirby all the way back to square one again, making that horrible, blood-curling scream you get at the end all the more satisfying to hear. <sighs> That's what separates Marx from the rest of the Kirby cast to me. No matter how many villains are overwhelmed by artifacts of infinite power, no matter how many tap into dark secrets to heal their heartbreak, no matter how many see the error of their ways and seek redemption, Marx is always going to be the exception to that rule. <laughs> He's got that personal connection to Kirby that Dedede's got, mixed with the traitorous moves of Magalore and the presence of any number of flashy final showdowns, all combining to create a character who's as hard to forgive as he is to forget. And later appearances lean in hard to his duplicitous nature. Getting 120 energy spheres in Kirby's Return to Dreamland reveals that somebody with knowledge of the clockwork stars and a grudge against the pink puffball told Magalore of Kirby, Marks being the obvious candidate. It's a vague theory, but hey, traitors beget traitors. Star Allies, the game itself, seems shocked that a final boss like Marks would help out Kirby. Pause screens assuring that, oh, well, maybe he's evil, but he's fine as long as he's well fed. You know, like how you pacify Kirby? Doesn't stop him from being the only DLC dream friend to serve as a credits boss, of course, but no, 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 he's good. You can trust that face. Super Smash Brothers Ultimate dials his creepiness up to 11 his soulless eyes as he rolls into battle, feeling unnerving even when Sephiroth's in the scene. Oh. New attacks are added to the Jester's act, inflating his eyes just like a balloon to gargantuan size and unleashing a barrage of lasers, spreading his veins out like a plant's roots to entangle and burn foes, melting his own eyeballs into shadow before having them chase a player around. No matter who you are or how you fight him, there's always the feeling that something ain't right with this boy. To the point where Marx actually had to be toned down from his original concept as to not up Ultimate's age rating on his own. In a series like Smash, encapsulating every franchise it can get its workaholic little hands on, representing every tone and feeling it can possibly manage, it's Marx that gets the title of the creepy one. <laughs> and really, who else was going to challenge him? 
He's the antithesis of Kirby, after all. The goodest of gumballs that many were introduced to and fell in love with through Smash. What better way to make a statement than to take that feeling and laugh right in its face? Marks was the first final boss I ever beat in a video game. He's not a complex villain. He wants to cause trouble, he does it, he dies, he comes back, he dies again while trying to damage your ears. But it's how devoted he is to his simple concept and how it stands in opposition to Kirby at a fundamental level that turns him from a final boss with a neat design into a memorable baddie. Kirby's an all-powerful friend who wants to make you smile. Hi. Marx is an all-powerful traitor who wants to laugh at your expense. Oh. That's really all there is to it, but that's all there has to be. Clouds aren't supposed to be complicated after all. They're here to do the absolute most they can with a simple, predictable routine. And I think there's beauty in that. And also, I really wanted to talk about Marx. You don't need to go through hours of lore to understand Marx. You can pretty much look at him and know what you're gonna get. But the show he puts on, the spectacle of his limited appearance, the little things he does to sell his mischievousness, and the fact that he's being mean to Kirby of all people, specifically, that's more than enough to make a standout baddie. You don't need much besides a good design and the right foil to play off of to make a performance worth remembering. Take a step back, figure out the core of the character you want to twist, and put on your clown shoes. And you'll also figure out how to design for corruption.